The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back to the House of Mystery on Independent Talk Radio, KFNX, 1100 AM Phoenix. I'm your host, Al Warren. Uh, today, um, we're joined with a credible guest. He's got um, uh, quite a history in broadcasting, former Coast to Coast, who left in 2013 to get his Ph.D. at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. And that's part of the Arizona State University um, and he's here today to talk about his new book, and it's A Black Knight for the Bluegrass Bell, and that's The Murder of Verna Gar Taylor and the Kentucky Honor Code Killings. Uh, Ian Punnett, thank you for being on the show. Oh, please. Thank you for having me. And sorry for any confusion in booking you. In fact, um, you know, it's always good to, to be on the air anywhere near Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is still, and my son is still, and... I'll be back there again coming up for the holidays. Yeah, no stranger to Phoenix. Um, <laughs> not at all. In fact, I, how far away are you from Cronkite? Um, not very. Not very. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, <laughs> what made you go to uh, get your uh, PhD? Just, just curious. Well, sure. No, I had um, <clears throat> I developed what is termed debilitating tinnitus. Um, the uh, the the ringing in my head had gotten to the point where it was just a point of distraction 24-7. So um, tinnitus or tinnitus, is, as I call it, because tonight it's us, every night it's us. <laughs> um, <clears throat> tinnitus is one of those things that it comes and goes in terms of uh, the loudness for most people, but for me it's at a fairly constantly high rate, and um, it, it was... It was such that it was becoming increasingly hard to concentrate while I was on the air live. So I needed to, it, and it was getting worse to the point where the the doctors had pretty much said, unless you find a new career uh, where you're not wearing headphones and you're spending your whole life surrounded by audio at various levels, you're pretty much looking at not being able to hear your grandchildren. And I thought, well, that's just not worth that trade-off. So um, I took an assessment. I, I had done well in radio, and I thought I could take a couple of years off to, um, to pursue a Ph.D. because I've always felt like a teacher. I worked with a lot of young people at all the stations where I had worked, and I had been in, tried to always be very instructive in helping people move along faster in their careers, and I just thought it was a natural transition. Plus, I'm very interested in issues regarding journalism and mass communication. Mm. And there's a lot of those issues uh, lately, that's for sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in fact, it's interesting to see how many things I had studied have become more prominent in our culture and not less, which is a good timing, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it fits. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how much reality there is to this. I, I, I don't know how much worse the media really is now than it was uh, back in the day of lots of newspapers. Well, I think that's the fair point. It's just, is it really different? I don't think so. And I, is it bad? It's what people want. If they didn't want it, it would change. And people say they don't want it, but they actually, usually what they want is media the way it appeals to them. Frequently, most people like a, prefer a kind of a, an, an echo effect with their media. They want their media to confirm their views are right. And they don't like media to always be challenging them and going, nope, think you're wrong on that. Nope, think you're wrong on that. And so that's why, it's to make your point, to go back to the days of where there was 150 newspapers on every corner, that's exactly what people got. Um, in Phoenix, maybe not the best example of that, because by the time Phoenix really started to take off, it, it kind of missed that heavy phase of, like you would have seen in Chicago or New York or Cleveland, where you would have had the the Swedish American daily newspaper that was in Swedish and then next to that was the Swedish American you know Tribune which was for Swedish readers but in English or Swedish on different pages I mean so we look at we look at things very differently today without realizing how much they they were like the kind of fractured media that existed 150 years ago yeah yeah and now true crime sort of 
uh, which came first, do you think, true crime reporting or media? Uh, like, how do you? Well, I so I in the book I talk about it a little bit, but that is the basis of my PhD studies. And really, true crime as we know it uh, predates uh, it predates journalism. It predates mass communication. Uh, it, true crime is as a genre. It's a way of using crime to tell us about us. It's using crime stories, usually murder stories, to tell us about life. And so the, the proper origin of true crime, generally recognized as being uh, what we used to call execution sermons. And these were sermons that were performed by uh, circuit-riding preachers who would go between communities in the early days of the U.S. and in Europe, uh, and they would stop when they knew a town ha was going to execute somebody. And they would work with the condemned, usually, uh, tell their story before they danced at the end of the rope or they were beheaded, or as in the case of Europe, or, or other forms of death. And these executions um, were, were done with a, a kind of civic-mindedness. These sermons were, were presented as a kind of confirmation that I know this is horrible, but here's what the person did. Here's how they acted. Here's the, here are the gruesome details of their crimes. That's why this person must be put to death. And, and most often, I mean, this is really interesting, is that the condemned really did cooperate with the preacher, and they often stood up there in front of the whole community before they were executed, and they confirmed, I'm a horrible person, I, don't be like me, kids, while you're looking at me, don't do this. So they were kind of, they were kind of like morality narratives, and they still are. Um, and, and this is what comes out of that, they started, these execution sermons became so popular that the preachers started printing them and selling them, and out of that comes a lot of the early newspapers, crime reporting, but there was a thread from that that has always remained and was sort of dormant maybe even a little bit before it came back in the early part of the 20th century as true crime as we know it, which are just, you know, again, crime narratives with a purpose uh, and and with a different with a distinct point of view uh, that are here to teach us about us. Hmm. I wonder if we're coming back to the um, ha having the um, executions and. Uh... <laughs> well, you know the interesting part of course is that they don't do public executions anymore. There's a lot of people who would argue that that's the problem with executions, for two reasons: is that it gives too much power to the state to execute somebody privately that the community has to see the executions because with every execution, the community has a right to decide whether or not they want to do another one. Um, a famous French philosopher named Michel Foucault argued that, that the, the state has no right to hide its most heinous act, which is, which is state-sponsored murder, because the community could see that, and they could rise up against the king, as he would write it, say it. Um, and the, the state could go, no, this went too far. This person's crime does not justify him being executed. And, and so it really was to the benefit of the state to keep executions on the QT and very scientific and witnessed by very few. Um, and instead of being the public event that perhaps it should be for either because people will either learn from them better or because people will decide we don't want those. Yeah. Now, now how did you get into cr true crime in the sense of actually writing a book, um, coming from, let's say, coast to coast, and, and even before that, your morning radio and, uh, and, right. your, yeah, and your books being um, uh, not in that sense at all, like how to pray uh, when you're pissed at God and, and your... Um, your kid books, you got Dizzy the Mutt. Right. And all that. So wh Thank you. <laughs> what was the transition? Well, so here, I, I'll tie a pretty good thread, I think, between these. Dizzy the Mutt with a propeller butt, which is still available at Amazon, I think, yeah. um, and Jackula the Vampire Dog. These were both children's books I did for canine charities. So I did them to raise money 
um, to help with the neutering and spaying of uh, wild um, feral cats and dogs. Um, there was an organization that would go around humanely um, capture and then youth, not euthanize, sorry, anesthetize the animals, spay them, neuter them, and then release them back out again. Um, and when they did that, they just meant it slowly started to cut down on the wild population of cats and dogs. That was in Minnesota. So I did those two books for them, um, and that worked out pretty well, raised a little, little bit of money. And so that was sort of a, that was part of my component is a, I'm an ordained deacon in the Episcopal Church, and I just I felt like that was something I could do that would help. Um, it was also fun because I love children's books, and I like writing books that, that are different. So Dizzy the Mutt with a Propeller Butt was just written to make kids laugh. And Jackula the Vampire Dog is a slightly <laughs> darker, kind of Maurice Sandak kind of book that I just love, but not everybody loves it as much as I did, apparently. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, and then, how to pray when you're pissed at God came out of a sense of trying to support people as they seek divine justice. There's a lot of people when they're sick, they're just really they're crushed. Their souls are crushed by being sick, and they don't understand why it's happening to them. And they've lost that ability because, as they used to tell me when I was doing rotations as a as a hospital chaplain, he's telling me I can't pray. I'm so so pissed at God, I just, I can't even pray. And I would be like, well, just let God have it. If you feel like saying something, say it. If you really believe that there is an omniscient God, who do you think you're hiding those thoughts from anyway? Right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so you might as well get it out of your system and, and learn to pray through the anger instead of letting the anger block prayer. And so it was really a very therapeutic book about divine justice, um, so I've always been interested in justice, and, and, and whether it's social justice or divine justice, and in this case, with uh, um, a black knight for the bluegrass bell, it's earthly justice. Um, my, my grandmother's first cousin was Vernegar Taylor, a woman who was murdered by the former lieutenant governor of Kentucky in 1936, the 80th anniversary just passed, and then he got away with it. Yeah. Yeah, so so yeah. you were kind of relative to it in a way. I grew up hearing these stories. There is no time in my life when I didn't hear these stories. Um, her name, Gar, is a family name, so Taylor was her married name. She married into the Taylors of Zachary Taylor, former president. Um, and my family names in general are Gar and Blankenbaker and Taylor and Tyler, and obviously punted on my father's side. But the southern side of my family, the stories that we passed down were very formative. Um, and it, it's not just the story of Verna being murdered and Denhart getting a hung jury on his trial. It was the story of her three brothers who stepped up and decided to risk imprisonment or execution on their own um, by seeking a redress of this particular act um, by coming after Denhart. Um, and, and so I'd always heard these stories. They were very important to me, so important, in fact, that I named my oldest son Gar. Um, and, uh, and my wife named our other son after a family name on, on her side. And, and this is where, this is, this is it's just central to my understanding of the world, is that sometimes you have to do hard things to set it right again. Mm. And you have to make hard choices on principle. And the principle in this case, just to be clear, was not that he had gotten away with the crime, but that he had perjured himself on the stand. And he had told horrible stories about Verna in order to denigrate her to the jury and to the public. Um, he had he was he had already said bad things. He was about to say worse, and he was on the eve of his retrial. After having he was kind of a he was a drunkard. He was kind of a braggart. Um, he was a big personality. He was kind of a Trump-like figure in his day. Um, he thought he had the right to shoot people, honestly, and he 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 believed in excessive force. He he liked to talk about. He 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 liked to he reveled in it, and um, he was telling everybody what he was going to say about Verna 
the next day when the new trial started and her three brothers made sure he never had a chance to get up on the stand and perjure himself. Wow. So uh, when you say he got away with it, what, what was what was sort of the um, uh, relationship between Verna and... Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was a great question. So she was a 40-year-old widow. She was she had married her high school sweetheart. They were very happy. He died of a disease young. Um, she she was she was forty after five years after his death, and she was raising two girls. One was twenty, the other was seventeen. Um, she was running her own business. She had inherited it from her husband. It was a laundry and dry cleaning business, but it was very prosperous because it was the only one of its kind in a very wide area, and she had a contract with the Kentucky Military Institute to be their sole provider of laundry. So she had a steady income. She owned a car. She owned her house. Besides owning the business, she even had a phone in her house, which, you know, for the Depression in 1936 was a luxury. And she was quite a dresser, and she was beautiful. Um, she was shapely. She was still very vivacious. Um, everybody loved her. And and Denhart was 61 years old. He'd been kind of run out of office. He was known already as the most hated man in Kentucky. Um, he was responsible in large part for what was called an incident called Bloody Harlan down in Harlan County. He was in the, got himself in the middle of a, of the labor wars and was known for his excessive force, so much so that they had a warrant out for his arrest and he had, had to be pardoned by the governor to avoid incarceration. He had already been shot by another guy because he had called the home of a political rival and told his 11-year-old daughter, tell your daddy to drop out of the race or he's a dead man. <laughs> To an 11-year-old girl. <laughs> wow. This guy's senior villain, right? I mean, this guy is despicable me. This guy is, he doesn't see any boundaries at all on what he can say or have printed. And as a result, um, though, he, 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 he was unelectable. He tried to run again for office. He couldn't. And by, 61, by age 61, his career was pretty much over. But he made enough money, and he bought a gentleman farm not far from Verna, they were introduced. He had courted her. He had known her for about six weeks when he offered her a ring and proposed. He told her she didn't have to tell him right away. He proposed marriage, but back then, just being somebody proposed it, you could think about it, and she was thinking about it. Um, and then she decided she was going to turn down his proposal. And the night that the whole family knew she was going with Denhart. Um, she was going out actually in the afternoon, which turned into a night because essentially he wouldn't let her go home. Um, that was the day that she gave the ring back, and he went kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. And he slowly tortured her, uh, meaning that he wouldn't let her go home. He kept driving around the state of Kentucky, and eventually they ended up on a very you know sort of lonesome highway outside of LaGrange, and that's where he shot her. Wow. But so, he claimed that it was suicide, and that was his defense, that she had taken his gun, and she had decided she couldn't live without him. So she shot herself with her right hand through her left side. <laughs> she, when they found her body, she was clutching gloves in her left hand, but the wound was on the left side of her body. So the defense had to argue, we'll never know why she decided to shoot herself through her left side with her right hand in a shot which is virtually impossible. I have a replica of the weapon, and you it, you have to hold the gun upside down in order to even get a thumb on the trigger. Wow. Uh, well, how did they sell it? I guess they could get quite creative uh, being the defense. They, it's not like they have to follow facts as oh. correct, right? So You ask good questions. Yeah, exactly. And that he he did what O.J. did. In fact, what's really interesting about the O.J. Simpson trial and this is O.J. said the same thing after the death of Nicole Brown Simpson. He said, I couldn't have killed her. I loved her too much. That is almost word for word what Denhart said when people said, but you killed her. Oh, I couldn't have killed her. I loved her too much to kill her. 
<laughs> whatever that means to the narcissist sociopaths that do these sorts of things. But um, he, um, the defense was a dream team, just like O.J. Simpson. He he took his money and his prowess, and he hired some of the best attorneys in the state of Kentucky, including a guy named John Marshall Barry, whose son is Wendell Berry, who is a former poet laureate and a well-known figure today. Um, and, um, and so John Marshall Berry and several of the other better-known attorneys were all on Den Hart's team. And they concocted a couple of different narratives, which they sold alternately to the jury, but all of which were based on the idea that either Verna shot herself or some other person drove by and shot her. We don't know which one. <laughs> well, that's a fantasy. Um, <laughs> the jury was hung. The jury was hung seven to five in his favor. Some people allege that money passed under the table too, but you yeah. know, and no one can know that. Right. Uh, well, what was? Uh, so was he that that rich and popular to be able to get this dream team and to sway the jury? Was he that influential? It's the depression. You know, people saw uh, he owned a piece of a bank in Bowling Green. He owned a piece of a um, of a newspaper. He and his brother co-owned, um, I think, it was the Park City News. But I could be wrong off the top of my head in Bowling Green. And they, so he he it was the depression. And here are these attorneys, they got to still make a buck. There's less work out there. And here's this rich guy. So they all agree, I'll be your attorney. Um, but part of what I document for quite a bit of fun in the book, is how, in the end, none of them ended up getting paid. Oh. He he kept chintzing them. He kept saying, oh, I pay, I pay, I pay, I'll pay you lots of money, just get me up. And he kept finding excuses, including the fact that he accused one guy of being a bad lawyer, even though he got him off, <laughs> um, and refused to pay his bill, and then said, okay, well, I'll pay a little bit. And he hemmed and hawed. And to, in, in the end, I'm not sure which one of the attorneys got any money at all. Uh, so this was a, a sensational uh, trial. It was huge, I guess. It was sort of similar to what, you, like, O.J. Simpson. In it was. It was top of the fold all over the country. Everybody was covering this trial, partly because of a certain amount of north-south bias. Um, this was a time when generally the country still thought of states like Kentucky and West Virginia as being filled with Hatfields and McCoys. Yeah. <laughs> and this was a feud. And the rest of the country loved the Hatfield and McCoy story. I mean, it had been made into like three movies already by 1936 and was already, you know, the basis of a popular book. And it was already an expression. And so I think that a lot of ways the press was playing off of that idea of, of a feud between the Gar family and the Denhart family and, and that, you know, the, then there was also the political angle. He was, at the time of his trial, still the sitting adjutant general of the Kentucky National Guard. Um, so he had some prominence. Um, and he, I mean, the, the trial was covered by Time Magazine, the New York Times. Uh, Chicago Tribune planted a reporter there. Cincinnati Inquirer, obviously the Louisville Courier Journal, St. Louis Post Dispatch. I mean, the the number of papers that showed up every day for his trial um, it, it accounts for the fact that even I was reading headlines in Phoenix for the old Arizona Republic, right? So the Arizona Republic carried the story top of the fold almost through the entire trial, but always front page. If it wasn't top of the fold. That's probably an old expression for yeah, a lot of that's... people today, but <laughs> a lot of kids are like, top of the fold. Yeah. How, do you fold a, how do you fold a laptop? What, yeah. do, you, what do you do? You mean down? Yeah. You fold it down? Yeah. Um, but um, the, it, was, it was, in fact, it, the story was so big that the day of his hung jury verdict was the day the Hindenburg crashed. Ooh. And the next day all over the country, Denhart was the headline. Hindenburg appeared underneath it. Wow. So it was big. Uh, how did, do we know how people reacted to it? Yeah. Were, were they supportive of it, or did they think that uh, um, he got away with it? Well, I think generally two things. So, again, really good question. The, and this is something I, I find very interesting because I find it so contemporary. So if people would read A Black Knight for the Bluegrass Bell, I think they'd find a lot of current resonances with the way in which we cover trials on TV today. But at the time, I think going into the trial, 
there was there were very few supporters of Doug Hart. But the defense did a great job. They obfuscated everything. And one of the things which they came after, which will seem ironic today, was the prosecution's attempt to use crime science. Mm -hmm. Crime science was brand new in 1936. Fingerprints had been around for a while, but the idea of doing like blood analysis and blood spatter analysis um, and um, and they were doing they were doing paraffin wax tests to show who had fired a weapon. Uh, Denhart had fired a weapon. Verna had not. So we just look at it right there. Verna did not fire a weapon. Period. Right. Um, but they used. They were saying, oh, but she was being buried. They washed her hands, so it must have washed off. And you can tell you can tell a jury all day long. No, no, no. That type of evidence doesn't wash off because it's embedded in the pores of your skin. That's why you use the paraffin wax to get it out. And but it was an unsophisticated, unsophisticated jury, and and what the defense said was, "This is all voodoo science. It's all voodoo. Yeah. They're coming after Denhart for politics." The the particular sergeant who was in charge of the Louisville Police Crime Lab was a guy named Mesmer, and their their chant, much like if the glove doesn't fit, quit, you must. Sorry, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. Yeah. The chant of the defense for Denhart was, it's all Mesmer and politics. And they said, Mesmer's not a real scientist. This isn't, these aren't real results. Um, you can't trust them, and it's all politics. He's just being manipulated by the political machine to come after Denhart. Yeah. And there's certain bells you can't unring in a jury's mind, and I think that's why he got a 7-5 to five, uh, home jury. That's unbelievable. How, how do people... Um, get swayed by this, but um, uh, and I mean that because even like we mentioned today, how it's similar in 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 a lot of the aspects of people get um, I don't know they just get things in their head and they follow. It's almost cult like, right? It is, and I think that that's he was a big personality, you know, and he 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 talked a good game, and he got up on the stand. I mean, to his credit, he got up on the stand for his defense, and that. That swayed a lot of people. Uh, the fact that he perjured himself, <laughs> yeah. they, they had no way of knowing. But he told a, a, a believable story about that night. The fact that it was one of about four different versions of that, of that particular event. He told so many different versions. He would, just, he would test them out. As narcissists, sociopaths tend to do, you know, truth is expedient. It's what you need it to be at that moment. So you just change the narrative. I never said that. That never happened. And you, you stand by that until you have to say later on, I never said I never said that. And then you change it again. To, so he was very persuasive. And by the end of the trial, people started to believe, well, may, maybe, maybe there's not enough here to convict him. But what was interesting was he didn't, he didn't like a lot of narcissist sociopaths, he couldn't stop himself from relitigating. So he was the one that actually kept bringing it up. And the family even said, and we have this in print as well as within my family, is the family said, if he had just shut up, if he had just taken his victory and been quiet about it, we would never have done anything. But he was trying to convince everybody that he was the victim here. Don't you see? I was the victim. You should be loving me. And, and they didn't. They, they generally they, they thought, okay, well, there wasn't enough to convict him. But he's still guilty as hell, and that's the part that just stuck in his craw. He couldn't stand the fact that people thought that, you know, he was still guilty. They just didn't, it bugged him. Right. So he wouldn't stop talking about it. He would go, he would have things in the paper, he would, he would get drunk, and he would tell everybody gathered at this particular tavern, they would say, what's the real story of what happened that night? Well, I'll tell you for some drinks. Yeah. So they all be buying him drinks. Yeah. So, so he's typical, as in, um, as we've seen, uh, even in modern times, uh, someone that can just um, they they believe what they're saying. Is that a narcissist sociopath? Yeah. They actually believe oh. it. And even if you have it on tape, but back then, I guess they wouldn't have things on tape. Um, but, but they'd have five witnesses. Yeah. And he'd still deny it. Five objective witnesses that said, I mean, after his after Verna was dead. Verna, they hadn't even found her body yet, and and they were going out. They were going up the road to go find her body. To to you know, I'm just tipping a little bit of what's in the story. 
And Denhar turns to the people before they've even left, before they made any determination. And he says, she was the finest woman I ever knew. <laughs> and he's talking about her in the past tense. Right. And they all thought, that's like the weirdest thing for a supposed fiancé to say. And he kept saying it. He said it to the coroner. He said it to the sheriff. She was the finest woman I ever knew. And then finally they were like, okay. And then later on he denied ever saying that, said everybody made it up. So, so what, 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 what is it exactly that um, made him kill her? And I mean that in a psychological part. So oh, no, no. Yeah, it's it, rage killing and an impulse kill by narcissist sociopaths. Right. They have a very fragile self-perception. Um, and I worked with a forensic, uh, well, two forensic psychologists on this, one of whom's an expert on narcissist sociopathic behavior, and the other's a forensic psychologist, um, a well-known woman named Catherine Ramsland. And both of these people, Dr. Les Carter and Dr. Ramsland, both agreed that this, there's no way that Verna killed herself. She doesn't fit a suicidology. There's no, she had no reason to kill herself. Um, but Denhart knew that he would be exposed. At the time, the feeling was he was just mad because she had turned him down. But I believe, and I effectively make the case in the book, uh, based on the evidence from the trial and the evidence from the testimony of the medical examiners, she was examined once, buried, exhumed, and examined again, and both times they agreed that she'd been the victim of a sexual assault. Oh. He was drunk. I believe he thought for sure he could not let her get home to her brothers. He could not let her get home to her family because once they found out, if she told anybody what had happened, he would be ruined. So he had to make sure that there was no witness to his attempted assault. And the physical evidence was on her body that it happened. Mm. So I think it's that exposure that is what triggers the rage in a uh, in a narcissist sociopath. They have to control everybody because they they're the their narrative is the only one that matters, and, and anybody else is just standing in their way. So when they get uh, kind of backed into a corner or are put into a place where they have to do something to control, like kill, they'll do it. You could you could Google it, narcissist, sociopathic, rage killer, or impulse rage, or other words like that. That's where they'll tell you women who have been in relationships with the narcissist, sociopath, they just snap. If you ever saw if you ever saw the Jinx on HBO with Durst, right. the story of you know Robert Durst, he snaps. He he's about to lose everything. He's not getting his way. He's about to be divorced. He's about to be whatever, and he just snaps. And then he kills. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's how it is. It's just that that's and then then for him, it's a game of just getting away with it because he's so smart or he's so rich, and that's where Denhart was too. Wow! So they decided to um, retry him. Yep, the state wouldn't settle for it. In fact, he was actually up for two murder trials. He was linked to a previous murder. The the the, the story the book begins with is the story of the lady in blue. Um, the there's a famous ghost haunting at the Hotel Seelbach. It's a Seelbach Hotel Hilton now, but um, at the time it was the hotel. It was just the Seelbach, and it was one of the most, it still is one of the most famous hotels in Louisville. It's a beautiful hotel. So you only got the only five diamond rated restaurant in the state of Kentucky is as at the Seelbach. It's a wonderful place, and it's haunted by a woman named the Lady in Blue who has been seen many times, and she's been linked directly to a prostitute who was pushed down an elevator shaft about two weeks before Denhart started dating Verna. Wow. And he was seen there that night, and he was known to frequent prostitutes, um, party girls, as they were called, so you invited <laughs> a bunch of them over to your hotel room to party, and, uh, and he was seen in that lobby, and he was seen with her. And so there was a suspicion that he's the one that pushed her down the shaft um, when whatever, for whatever reason, we don't know. But they were going to prosecute him for that. So he was, he was up for the retrial for Verna, plus a lingering prosecution that had just started um, for the, the death of, uh, of Patricia Wilson. Um, and so, 
you know, that that's what was hanging over his head the night that her three brothers met him outside of the Armstrong Hotel in Shelbyville, Kentucky, and decided they weren't going to give him the chance to make up more stories about Verna. So their intention, the Gar brothers, were to uh, to end his life. Yes, they claim no, but clearly yes. Yeah. I mean, the the, the funny thing is, so of course they have to go on trial themselves. They are they shoot Denhart in front of the entire town of Shelbyville. <laughs> The, and and they hand over their guns to the police. They just hand them over. Two of the three brothers actually are the only ones who did the shooting. The third, the youngest brother, was prevented from having a gun. He was in his 30s, but he had a new baby coming. And later on, that new baby, by the way, would become Miss Ohio 1955 <laughs> and compete for the Miss America passion. But um, at the time, the three brothers turned their guns over and they fully copped to it they said we shot this man and they went on trial uh and that's the other part of the book is the gar trial um as they kind of did exactly what denhar did they just decided to game the system and they 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 pulled as many shenanigans as denhar did in getting his hung jury it's just they got a very different ending Right. Is that sort of like uh, part of your title when you when you say the Kentucky Honor Code killing? Um, is, is that what you're getting at with the yeah. trial? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, an honor code killing used to be you would kill somebody to protect the family honor, but that you were willing to take the consequences. So it was not – I mean, if they had wanted to just do a revenge killing where they were – you know, they were just going to, they could have shot Denhart about a thousand times before the night he died. They were protecting her honor from his future testimony, not from what he had already done. And that's the honor that they were protecting. If it meant going to prison to save their sister's honor, that was going to be worth the trade off. Wow. Uh, so the honor killing's not exactly as we th- we think it is. It's, it's, um, it's, it's protecting her, her, um, her virtue, in a Her way. virtue, in a way, yeah. I mean, Denhart was telling people, as I mentioned, you know, buy me drinks, I'll tell you the whole story. And we have it in print, what he was saying at the time, because reporters were everywhere on this story. And the there were reporters from the True Crime magazines that loved this story. This story appeared in True Crime magazines a dozen times, um, before, during, and after uh, Denhart's trial. Um, and it, so they covered it from the very beginning. They wrote about, in fact, the title itself comes from a true crime magazine title, The Iron General in the Bluegrass Bell. He was known as the Iron General. It was not a flattering term. It was because of his inflexibility. He was just, he was not a people person. It was his way, the highway. And if you got in his way, any subordinate could be hit, shot at, kicked, humiliated. He was not a good leader, and um, and so the Iron General, as is you know, sarc- as he was sarcastically referred to as, um, was one of those things that they had been covering for a while in the true crime magazines, and they followed the Iron General into a bar, and they wrote down the things that he was saying about Verna, and the things that he was going to be testifying to coming up in the trial, and they were all about the fact that she wasn't just sleeping with him, she was sleeping with lots of people. Oh, so he he was just going to defame her totally. Oh, he had gone down the road many times that she was that she was a, a whore. Without saying it, he would just he would talk about you know he 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 made up this story about how Verna was sleeping with her uh, delivery truck driver for the laundry and dry cleaning place. A, a young kid, twenty two years old, twenty three years old named Chester Wolfuck, who couldn't look anybody in the eye. I think today we might think of him as being maybe slightly autistic or, or whatever. He was, he was, you know, he just he had a hard time talking to people. He would, he would cross the street if he thought he would say something to him. And, and he, even though he came from a very wealthy family, in fact, Chester Wolfuck's first cousin was D.W. Griffith. Oh. <laughs> Birth of a Nation, yeah. famous director. Yeah. And... On the night of the Gar trial, D.W. Griffith uh, came to the Gar boy trial in Shelbyville, Kentucky, for their killing of Denhart. 
and he asked whether he could make a movie of their story. And they told him politely, no, we're just going to let this go, and we'll let it be. They didn't want to... They didn't want to be hypocrites. They believed that Denhart could have, should have just laid low after he got a favorable jury verdict, and he, they weren't going to contradict themselves. So when D.W. Griffith wanted to make a movie, they turned, he turned him down, and D.W. Griffith never made another movie and died a couple of years later. Wow. An interesting story. What happened to the Garbrot brothers then? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. So again, these are my grandmother's first cousins. Um, and the oldest one was Doc, the middle one was Roy, the young one was Jack. Um, even at the time of the shooting, Jack had moved to southern Ohio to a farm. They were all farmers to some degree, but they were prosperous. I mean, they owned property, they farmed it, but they, each, they also had other jobs. Doc was a veterinarian, um, and he, had, he was a World War I veteran. He had suffered from shell shock after World War One, and he had twice voluntarily gone into a sanitarium. Um, he, uh, he, he was one of the people that shot Denhart, and they had a hard time trying him because he pretty much had a nervous breakdown after that. And then he had another one, and then he died of an, uh, of an ulcer, which was much worse than anybody had ever thought. It was a very painful, horrible death within about a year of the trial. Um, uh, Roy became kind of a recluse, but he'd always had been. Roy and Jack were in business together. Um, they raised championship hunting dogs. They, bef long before Verna and the story of Denhart, um, they had already appeared in Field and Stream. They had won competitions in the U.S. and Canada for their the training of their hunting dogs. And back then were a lot more you know, it was kind of a have and have nots kind of culture in the Depression. Um, wealthy people still went hunting with hunting dogs, and you didn't have to. I mean, they they made essentially the the Cadillac of hunting dogs. They trained them. And they were that, so they were prosperous, both with their farm and their side business, and they continued with both um, until Roy's death. He continued to train hunting dogs. He only did a couple a year toward the end, and people fought over who would get a gar dog. Uh, because they were that prized in Kentucky. Um, Jack continued to train too, but he also got into other businesses and, and died prosperously in Southern Ohio. Wow. Well, so it, after the trial. After the trial. Wow. Well, it all turned out okay. <laughs> it rebalanced the scales. Yeah. I mean, and, and interestingly enough, I mean, I think, you know, my wife struggles with this story in some ways because she she just says but it's still murder i mean they still the garboy still murdered denhart and i say yep yeah <laughs> and <laughs> but what was interesting was they were put on trial and and in their in their defense i mean they were the defense offered so many kind of almost funny i think one of them is purely comical um they said to the jury um, they claimed that the Denharts, I'm sorry, that the Gar brothers, Roy in particular, was suffering from emotional, what do they call it, emotional insanity. <laughs> so as soon as he saw Denhart outside of the hospital, outside of the hotel, he went emotionally insane and therefore shouldn't be held responsible for his actions. And when, when asked, um, when did the emotional insanity pass, the doctor actually said, and the doctor, being a friend of the family, said, oh, pretty much right after he shot Dan Hart, he felt a lot better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then the other thing is that def his, the defense attorneys for the Garboys stood up in front of the jury and said to the jury, we all know Dan Hart was a mad dog. And you got to put down a mad dog. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, they, they called it for what it was, and I say that to my wife, too. I No one's trying to hide the fact. No one's dressing it up for what it is. But it stopped somebody, and very likely, I think they stopped Denhart from killing again someday. Yeah. Uh, do we think that um, Denhart was a um, mass killer or just... Um 
Well, at least two. I mean, so I think he's he stands as the likely suspect in the death of Patricia Wilson. He's the only suspect. He was the only official suspect, and he was again awaiting charges on that. Um, and and so that's two. Um, there were plenty of people who were in in Harlan County in Newport, Kentucky, which was the scene of a very famous labor strike, where as adjutant general of the um, of the Kentucky National Guard, uh, Denhart rolled in tanks on the favor of the side of of, uh, of management over labor. He was known for cracking people on the head with a revolver, um, just smacking them silly, some of whom never quite recovered. He was known as an, as an officious martinet who just really didn't care whether... He just wanted to be praised by the people in power, the people that owned the coal companies or or in this case in Newport, it was a different type of strike, but the same idea. And so who knows? Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's an interesting case. Um, great book. Are, are, are you going to continue to write true crime now? Well, see, now that brings us back to our first question. Yeah. <laughs> we circle all the way back to the beginning. So I, I have a trilogy in mind. So my trilogy for How to Pray When You're Pissed at God was Divine Justice. With this book, it's earthly justice. And with the next book, which I'm working on right now, which, assuming I finish my PhD dissertation at Cronkite School in May, which I'm on track to do, um, I think I would like to spend the summer researching a third book, which would be um, about cyber justice. So I'll go from divine to earthly to cyber. Uh, and the third book is about a story that involves cyber justice, which is actually harder to get than any other kind of justice there yeah. is. Yeah, and it's uh, definitely appropriate this time, you know, this age. Yeah, I think so. But I hope you enjoy the book, and um, and anybody who reads it, um, I look forward to They can keep in touch with me on Facebook, or um, I've got a Black Knight for the Bluegrass Bell Facebook page. Uh, and or they can follow me on Twitter at Deacon Punnett, D E A C O N P U N N E T T. And I look forward to answering any questions and engaging in any other theories that people have after after reading it. Fantastic. Well, we have it linked in our web page as well, and um, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, talking with you today. Thanks very much. You are so good at this. I'm so grateful you gave me time. You asked great questions. They were very intuitive. Um, and I, 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 I just, I'm grateful for the chance always to stand up for Verna because she didn't deserve to be accused of the things she did. And historical justice matters. And that's a, a hashtag I, I've been using a lot these days. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, and God right. bless. <laughs> thank you. To find out more about our show, guests or listen to a previous show, visit our website at www.somethingweirdmedia.com. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.